just in case you're visiting with us and you're wondering, do we always decorate like this? Just want to let y'all know that this week, upcoming week, will be our vacation Bible school, uh, which is, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with church lingo, that's kind of like a kid's camp uh, that kids come to all week from about 8 to noon, and we, we uh, spend all day with them, and it is going to be a quite, quite a time. And as you can tell, I want you to encourage you as part of a faith family is to walk around and look at the decorations. They are absolutely awesome. You can come over here and see the jungles. You see the stage. You see underwater. Uh, go over into the fellowship hall. It, they, this, this team of people have done a fantastic job. So I want to just, and, and it kind of, it doesn't kind of, it, it goes with the message today and thinking about all that we're doing. Um, so what I want us to do, if you will, turn in your Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 5. The book of Galatians chapter 5. As you begin to turn there, I was thinking about this message and uh, I was uh, returning from my trip from Israel when I really began to pray about this, this series, uh, about the One Another series. Um, and on the trip to Israel, there is a night that we stay in a hotel on the shore of the Dead Sea. In the evening, as we come there, we've uh, just come from En Gedi. Uh, we have an opportunity to travel down the, the road from En Gedi to the Dead Sea, and we're, we're at the Dead Sea, and uh, we go into the hotel, we check into the hotel, and then we go and we take a quote-unquote dip, um, because uh, it's due to the mineral content of the Dead Sea that you are not allowed to take a swim. You can only take a dip. You're unable to sink. So as soon as you come to the place you of relaxing, where, where we typically lay back and some of us float, uh, some of us sink, uh, you can't sink in the Dead Sea. You actually float on its surface. It is quite the, uh, quite the feeling to know that you're, to know that you're floating. Uh, the salinity, the salt content of the water is so high that literally when you reach down to pick up what you would think to be sand, you pick up rocks of salt. It is that high. I, I'll never forget um, uh, one of the people that went on this last trip with us. She wanted to take some of it, so she got a pill jar, and she put a bunch of this rock salt into the pill jar, and it looked just like crack cocaine. <laughs> and I told the individual, I said, I don't think we'll be taking that on any planes because I don't want to even be, any, even be taken into that direction. So, unfortunately, we did not weren't able to bring any back with us. The level of salinity actually allows no animals to exist inside of it. There is no life. And the reason behind, the reason it's called the Dead Sea, by the way, is because it, it only has input. It doesn't have output. It only has input. In other words, the Jordan River runs into the Dead Sea, but the Dead Sea being the lowest level on earth, it has nowhere else to go. It has no output. So it all accumulates there at the Dead Sea from the Jordan River, and it can't go anywhere else. The water literally can't move. So it accumulates in the Dead Sea only to be removed. The water is only to be removed by evaporation. The Dead Sea is now reducing at a rather remarkable rate. I think I, I might be wrong here, but I think it's something in terms of four inches a year due to the fact that what they are doing now is they are using the water from the Jordan River in the north, and that what being using the water in the Jordan River, it's no longer flowing south, so the Dead Sea is literally shrinking. Uh, I could take you to hotels that were built on the, um, on the shore of the Dead Sea 20 years ago, and now you have to take a car in order to get to the Dead Sea. It is quite amazing uh, at how it's, how it's not being able to replenish itself. The reason I go all through all this trouble to use the Dead Sea, I want to use it as an analogy for our message this morning on the reason why we are to serve one another. When we don't serve one another, when there is no outlet for us to do with one another what we are called to do, we become like the Dead Sea. There's no life in us. There's no depth for us. There's no output in our lives that causes us to become overwhelmingly salty. I think that's the new word I'm going to use to describe, to describe people who just seem puckered all the time. They're just salty. 
So then I can go into this whole, the whole idea of, let me explain the Dead Sea to you and where I got. I think that's going to be a good one. It just gives me, I think you're just salty. And then they'll, they won't have an idea of what I'm talking about. By the way, saltiness is good for moisturizing the skin, but it's deadly if it's ingested. When cut off from our source of sustenance, we slowly die over time. When, when our Jordan River is being consumed and we no longer have input into our lives, you will find even your spiritual life shrinking. And when you have no output, you, you find yourself becoming a little bit more salty. Have you found your response to some people just being a little bit more, a little bit more salty? No? I can tell you when my life becomes consumed about what you are going to do for me, when my worship becomes consumed about what I like, when church becomes consumed when what it's up, what's in it for me, I become very salty. But when I realize that when I come to a place and a gathering of people that we are to worship God and this place is really not about me, it's all about Him, my saltiness tends to kind of lose itself in the service of others. I find an output by serving instead of becoming salty by consuming. Do you hear what I'm saying, church? Are you with me? So this morning we want to look at creating a tributary, if you will. I want to create a tributary. I want to create a tributary of service so that our lives do not become like dead seas. So I want us to look at this in Galatians chapter 5. Man, there were so many places in the scriptures I could have pulled from, but God just really uh, taught, it spoke to my heart in this passage. It really drew me to this passage, and I hope that it will... It will draw you also. So Galatians chapter 5, we'll be reading three verses beginning in verse 13. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. This is the word of God. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Let us pray. I'm reminded in your word, dear Jesus, where you said you did not come to serve, but to be you did not come to be served, but to serve and to give your life as a ransom for many. If it is true that you are God of God and very, very God of very God, and you came and incarnated yourself, then God, what an example for us. That he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become his righteousness. That he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. God, if you come to serve, then what does that mean for us? So Jesus, I pray that in the midst of the reading of your word that you will impart your spirit upon us. God, you will draw us to yourself. God, your spirit would move in our lives and in our midst so that we may be your people. By being your people, we would demonstrate your kingdom and declare you as our king. Pray that you'll be with your servant this morning. Where I err in preaching your word, where I go, if it be possible for me to go wrong this morning, then dear God, may that be attributed to my account. But Jesus, where I speak truth, I pray that that would all be done for your glory. Guide my words this morning and may we be encouraged as we leave this place. And may we look for ways to truly serve one another 
and the way in which you've gifted us and direct us to. For it's in Jesus' name we pray these things and for his sake. Amen. So in this passage, I want us to look at first what I would call the foundation of serving. The foundation of serving. Paul is writing to a church in Galatia that is dealing with the insistence that, listen to me, in order for a Gentile convert to become a Christian or to come to Christ, that they must first abide by certain Old Testament rites, uh, namely circumcision. So what this church was saying is before a Gentile could become a Christian, they must first, in other words, become Jewish. Now I want you to remember that the church at this time is predominantly converted Jews that, have, that were Jewish, have converted to Christianity, and the question that is rising is, does the Gentile need to become a Jew in order then to become a Christian? And there was also accusations that Paul, check this out, that Paul was not an authentic apostle, and the reason he was not an authentic apostle was because he was softening the gospel. And why would they say he was softening the gospel? Is because he was letting Gentiles into the church. How dare him? How dare him allow sinners to be saved? So we find Paul having to write this letter in defending his ministry, really defending the gospel that God has called him to. And here in chapter 5, Paul begins by saying it was for freedom that Christ set us free. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Chapter 5, verse 1, it says it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. It is here that we find our foundation for serving. Now, some of you are going, what does our freedom have anything to do with our serving? I want you to notice in verse 13 that Paul said, for you were called to freedom, brethren. Verse 13, for you were called to freedom, brethren. So, I want us to first understand who is he speaking to. And I think it's fairly clear I don't have to go very far in this, in the idea that he was speaking to us, the believers, the brethren, those who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, that we were called into to freedom. We are reminded of who the brethren are called to be, and that is that we are called to be what? Free. That's good news. What are we called to be freed from? What are we called to be freed from? Well, there's some beauty in this. Let's turn to chapter 3, verse 13. Chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So, what are we called to be freed from? We are freed, or we are redeemed from the curse of the law. Through what? Faith in who? Jesus. Everybody with me, okay? Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, faith family, Our freedom provided to us provides the foundation for the way we serve one another. Let me pause real quick. I didn't do this at the beginning. I want to do it now. If you're visiting with us today, this is almost like a vacation of listening in on a family gathering. I'm speaking to our family, to the brethren, to faith family. The whole one another series is how are we going to be, how are we going to love one another? Okay? So I want you to know that this is what Christ is calling us to if we are to be with one another. And we just saw that our freedom provided us, provided to us, provides us the foundation for our serving. Now, the quite great question here should be, how? Well, thanks for asking. I was hoping one of you would ask me that, so I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer. And if you didn't want to know, I'm probably going to give you the answer anyway. So here it is. Paul will now give us two commands 
that takes us from the foundation of serving to the obligation of serving. So the first command from Paul tells us what not to do. And he says this, he says, do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. Do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. You see, ladies and gentlemen, this has been an issue since the very beginning of Christianity. It is what the idea of what theologians call antinomianism. Antinomianism. The idea of us, because we have been freed from the curse of the law, therefore we are no longer under the law, and therefore we can now live in freedom, and then here's the false reality conclusion, therefore we can now do as we please, because we are free. We are no longer under the law. We are no longer cursed of the law. Grace has come and set us free, and because it set us free, now we are no longer under the curse, and because we're no longer cursed, we can do as we want. It's the idea that now I got saved, Now I can live however I want to live because after all, pastor, aren't you saved by grace? But Paul is very clear that that idea is heretical to biblical faith. We are free so that we will no longer live according to our flesh. (laughs) You see, you are freed so that you will no longer live according to what you want to do. You were freed from living from what you wanted to do. Praise be to God. You see, we are free to no longer live according to the flesh, but now we are free to live according to the Spirit. When we use our flesh, we are seeking to fulfill something in us. Stick with me. You see, when you live with your fleshly desire... You are seeking in the flesh for something to fulfill us. We want something in this world to bring us fulfillment. We want something in this world. When we use our flesh, we are seeking for something to fulfill the emptiness within us, whatever it may be, in order to provide us power and authority to control the life we live. You see... To the religious and the Pharisee, what is it that they use in order to fulfill that emptiness in them? They use rules. They use rules. This is what you do. These are the rules. And I'm going to, matter of fact, I got some even more better rules. More better. I got some more better rules that I'm going to give you because these are the rules and this is how you're to live. And because now I have control and I have authority, now this is what I'm doing. Actually, I'm creating these rules to build me up because I'm trying to fulfill that emptiness in me. To the irreligious, they turn to other things in this world. Whether it be drugs, alcohol, Sex. But I want you to know that regardless of our method, we are returning our hearts and minds and our entire being to be enslaved to one futile desire after another to fulfill the emptiness that is deep within us. One theologian said it like this. He said, quote, What Paul is saying here is don't surrender your freedom that you have in all the satisfying, uh, I'm sorry, don't surrender your freedom that you have in the all-satisfying Savior of Jesus to return to the unsatisfying desires for the mere physical pleasures and self-exaltation, unquote. See, faith family, when we try to obtain freedom through the flesh, We are actually returning again to slavery. When we try to be free from doing the things of the flesh, we return to being enslaved by the flesh, and we submit again to the yoke of slavery. Now we're back under slavery. So we are obligated, the Bible says. We are commanded not to turn our freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. So that's what he tells us not to do. Do not turn your freedom into an opportunity to flesh. What does he say to do instead? 
Now watch. I've said the foundation for this is the fact that you've been freed. But now that you've been freed, you don't turn your opportunity in the flesh, but instead you use your freedom to what? Serve one another. Ah. You see, once our freedom, our justification has been established, we are no longer, listen to me, we are no longer enslaved to love others in order to fill an emptiness. But now we are able to love from the overwhelming grace we have been given. You see, once you've been freed, you are now truly able to love. But if you have never been freed, you will never truly be able to love. This is why no one can serve two masters. Serving wealth is asking wealth to provide you and to fill you in the emptiness. Yet serving God is only accomplished through the freedom that God has given. You cannot serve two masters. What do you think is going to provide you freedom in your life right now? What does our culture tell us is going to provide us with ultimate freedom? And here's the question I have. Is it providing people freedom? I'll never forget talking to a drug addict, and we were, we were working with this individual, and as we were talking to her, she came to me, and I asked her, what made you do heroin for the first time? And here's what she said, I just wanted to be free from all the world's trouble. So what did she do? She decided to put a needle in her arm and shoot up. Two years later, the thing that set her free, quote-unquote, had now enslaved her. Many people look for it through sexual relationships. You actually think that a sexual relationship is going to provide you freedom. It's going to provide you fulfillment. Many people try to do it through their work. You think your work is going to provide you. You think the next promotion is going to provide you with that fulfillment. Many people do it through their houses. You know, if I could just get this house, I'm going to be free. Many people do it through their, through their automobiles. You know, if I could just get this car, I'm going to be free. And here's what you find. The very thing you thought would bring you freedom has now brought you enslavement. Here's what our new generation is doing. They think these things called technology and cell phones provides them some sort of freedom. And here's what they are finding. It is binding them to the ultimate reality of having no freedom because you take a cell phone now away from a young person. And I dare to say this. I was just talking about this just the other day. I don't think it's just our, old, our young people. Now I see it some of our senior adults. You begin to take technology, whatever that technology is away from people, and here's what you begin to see. You begin to see them react in what they truly worship. What do I take, what can I take away from you that would cause you to be in bond, that has caused you to be in bondage? We can't serve two masters. Therefore, what are we to do? Through love, serve one another. We're to serve one another. Through love. You see, when we are freed from guilt and given grace, the response is that through love, we are to serve. When freed from the bondage to use people to get things, the response is that through love, we can now use things to help people. Ironically, the word for serve here comes from the root word for servant or slave. 
It's a slave that returns to a desire to serve, not out of duty, but out of delight. You are freed. You have been freed, but we are not to return to the bondage that we have. We are now freed to serve because now we no longer do things because we want something out of them. We do things now because we have the privilege of the delightful opportunity to love and to serve others. What would it look like, faith family? What would it look like if every time we stayed together, we were intentionally looking for ways to serve one another instead of being served? Too many of us have bought into the Aretha Franklin view of Christianity. Is it Aretha Franklin? What have you done for me lately? Who is that? Let's go with Aretha. I just blamed her for it. Paul Abdul, Janet Jackson, Janet Jackson. I knew I'd get it. Janet Jackson, view of Christianity. What have you done for me lately? Ooh, 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 yeah. (laughs) Right? There are people who walk into the door of a church asking that question. What have you done for me lately? Ooh, 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 yeah. Well, what if we all sat down in this place, faced one another, and asked that question? What have you done for me lately? Ooh, 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 yeah. Huh? We wouldn't be doing anything for anybody because we would always be looking for something to be done for us. Love is established in our freedom. Many of us are unable to serve one another because we still have something in it for us. Thereby, we're seeking to fulfill the desires of the flesh. Oh my goodness. I will never forget the moment I realized this with me and my wife. Now, I am going to step on toes in the next few moments. Because my toes have already been crushed. I'll never forget the time that I realized that I was doing this to my wife. Here's the way it looks. Wife asks you to do something. Because I don't want to get into an argument or because I want something from her, I am going to go do this something. I'm going to wash the dishes. I'm not going to say thank you or anything. It is deceptively wicked, our hearts. When we try to love, when we think that we're loving our spouse, when in all reality, the only reason we do half of the things we do is because we love ourselves. Ah, here's the way it works. I'm going to do it because I want to hear it. I don't want to hear it because I don't want to be uncomfortable. I don't want to be uncomfortable because I don't like argument. And because I don't like argument, I'm just going to do it. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to cover it with, I really love you. I love you and I'm going to do it for you. I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for me. I just don't want to hear the nonsense. What's going on in your heart? You see, this is where we're in a DNA and we lead to a lot of death. What's going on in your heart? When I realized that, it was, it was months of repentance and faith. It was months of repenting. It was months of repenting and saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe that I acted in that way. And now I love to do the dishes for my wife. Laundry, not so much. And that's okay. You hear what she said? And that's okay. Because let me tell you what, if you want all of our clothes coming out pink, get me to do the laundry, right? I still, I call her every, every time she asks me to do laundry, I call her. Hey, uh, cold hot water? Where do I put this stuff again? I just don't get it for some reason. I probably could if I wanted to. The point of that was many of us are unable to serve one another because we still have something in it for us. We're still seeking to fulfill the desires of our own flesh and thereby we're never really able to serve out of love. So we have the foundation for serving is our freedom. 
The obligation of serving is, Paul said that we are to serve and not give in to the desires of the flesh. And then thirdly, we're going to find our motivation for serving. Our motivation. And it's here that I think we see something that is totally unexpected. If I were to write this, I probably would not have written this. No, not probably. I would not have written this next. It is here we see that Paul has just finished that we are to, to speaking that we are now no longer under the law. But then he shows us that he is not saying that the law doesn't matter. Because then what does he do? Paul says the love which is the overflow of God's grace is actually what fulfills the law. The low, the love. The overflow of God's grace, the love that you, that you have in your life is what will come and fulfill the law. Other words, all God was after in the law was to have a people who were fully satisfied by His grace in such a way that they would pour forth love. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. When we serve one another through love, we are fulfilling the law. Now, I have just testified to you that I am a lawbreaker. I have not always served one another well, especially out of love. So therefore, I am a lawbreaker. That makes me in need of a redeemer. I'll get to that in a moment. But when we do serve, when we do love our neighbor as ourselves, we are fulfilling the law. It's lived out. It means that it means that you would want to feed the hungry. Listen, it, it's this idea. He said to love your neighbor as yourself. And it's this point that you would want to feed the hungry as much as you would want to be fed. Is that convicting? I know it is for this boy. That we would want to help someone as much as we would want someone to help us if we were in the same situation or circumstance. The very idea that we would use all of what God has given us to take care of ourselves and therefore because He has given these things to take care of ourselves, we will also use those same things to take care of the others around us. That's why I tell our missional community, my home is your home. My stuff is your stuff. You need my car, it's your car. You need my lawnmower, you, you use it. I, I don't even know how to work it. If you, you, need, you need my weed puller, use my weed puller. You need my, you need my uh, jacks, use my jacks. You need my tools, I don't know where they are, use them. I'm telling you this because this is truth. This is the reality. I don't own anything. I own nothing. I am merely a servant of God who has been given all that He has given me. It is His to give and it is His to take. I am merely uh, uh, managing. I'm a steward of what He has given me. Now, I will be a good steward. But in that stewardship, it means that now there is nothing I have that you don't have. The very idea that we would use all that God has given us to take care of ourselves, to therefore take care of those around me. How do we do that? Through serving one another. And if we don't, I will testify to the truth of this Bible coming true right in your very presence. Because if we don't love and serve one another, guess what we'll do? Bite one another. That's exactly what he says. He says, if we don't, we will end up biting and devouring one another. And then he gives us a warning that I do not think is by chance. He says, we will be, you are not, be careful that you are not consumed by one another. Why do we need, why does he give us the threat of not being consumed by one another? Is because when we look for others to fill us, we consume them. And I am here to tell you there is no man walking on the face of this earth 
There is no woman walking on the face of this earth. There is no uh, 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 thing on the face of this earth. There is nothing in creation that will be able to fill you. Nothing. Nothing. See, here's the truth. We can only love if we have been free to love. It's because we are free to love out of our abundance and not of our desires to fulfill some emptiness inside of us. And here in Faith Family Life, the beauty of the gospel, it is this. God is love. And it is out of His love that He has provided for you and me redemption. I told you I was a lawbreaker. I told you I, told you I needed forgiveness. I told, I told you I needed to be redeemed. And here's the beauty. It is through His love we have been set free. And we have been set free not to live now according to the flesh, but we have been set free so that we can now serve one another through love because we no longer need anyone to validate our identity because our identity has already been validated by the only one we need to validate it. Did you hear that? I can serve you and need nothing back from you. I don't need a thank you. It would be nice. I don't need a, hey, you're welcome, which would be great. I don't need anything. I can serve you and not need anything back from you because I am not serving you to gain something for myself. I am serving you because that's who Jesus has made me. He has made me a servant, so I have to serve. My identity is has been in God who is love and because he is love he loves and because he is loved he has loved me and now because he has loved me I am to love others God is love therefore he serves and because he serves he he calls me now to serve him and because now I am a servant I am to serve others it's not because I'm looking for you to fulfill some emptiness in my life it's because the emptiness in my life has been full by the only one who can fill it and now I don't need your approval I don't need your thanks I don't need that because now I can truly love you with all with all chains all shackles all things gone because now I no longer need you to say and validate me because I've already been validated Tetelestai It is finished Jesus finished it for me And whenever you begin to look for someone else to finish what he has already finished, you are telling Jesus that he hadn't finished it good enough. See, through serving one another, we actually serve the one who freed us. Did you know that? You do know that when you serve one another, you are actually serving the very one who freed you. Write this passage down, Colossians Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 through 24. Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 through 24. Paul writes, whatever you do, do your work, work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance. It is the Lord whom you serve, for the Lord not for men. Did you get that? Why? Because men cannot provide what the Lord has already provided. When we serve one another, we demonstrate the cross to one another. Serving one another is the outworking of our salvation with fear and trembling. Serving one another is the daily taking up of our cross and following Jesus. We become a people who embody redemption because we have been set free and now thus able to love through serving one another. Which is a stark contrast, by the way, to the world we find ourselves in that is enslaved by selfishness and greed and unbelief. A culture, work cultures that say the only way you can make it to the top is by stepping on the people around you. We say, no, we're going to serve one another. Faith family, we were created to serve. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus beforehand. For good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them, right? It is true 
It is true that we are all gifted so differently. Praise God. I mean, I like vanilla, but too much vanilla almost becomes too much vanilla. I like some chocolate, some strawberries every now and then. I feel like I'm Rick up here talking about food. Every time Rick preaches, he talks about food. I'm just getting y'all ready for lunch, right? But I do. I like the diversity. And I know that God has come and He has gifted us differently. It is true we are all gifted to serve differently, but we are reminded that we are all to serve the same Lord. Serving isn't an option. How we serve is the gifting by the Spirit who alone gives us what we have according to God's gift of grace given to us by the power that works in us. And it is through that that now we are to serve. Not for credit. No, 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 no. Not for credit. What credit do we get? What credit do we get when it is the overflow of our thanks to God? You see, when you serve in order to get credit, when it's supposed to be serving out of the overflow, you are like the child who always says, who always tells their dad to say thank you after they've done their chores. You ever seen this? I have three. Dad, say thank you, I did my chores. Dad, I made my bed. Yay? No, say thank you. Right? You, it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? It sounds ridiculous. Dad, I, I ate my food. Well, I hope you did. And this is what we've done in the culture, right? This is how we parent now. Thank you so much, little Johnny, for doing what you were supposed to do. What? No, little Johnny, that's what you were supposed to do. You ought to say thank you, Dad, for teaching me to clean my, to do my, uh, to make my bed. <laughs> that's crazy. Okay, I know I'm off the reservation now. It's okay. <laughs> Dad, you need to be proud of me. Now, Dad, you need to be proud of me. You know, Dad, I made my bed. Dad, I made my bed. And now you need to be proud of me. And now I'm going to ask you to do something for me. Now, how many of you are already in your mind going, that's, that's, something, that's something weird, right? Now, how many of you do that spiritually? Yo, God, look at all I'm doing for you. You know, I'm just coming to you with a little prayer request. You can, you know, you can, uh, you can throw me a few thousand dollars here and there. You know, I've done a lot for you, God. Aren't, God, aren't you, aren't you pleased with me? God, aren't, God, God, hey, God, are you, you good now? Are we good? Is this all? Uh, can I tell you something, church? One of the most beautiful realities that came to my life as a Christian when I fully come under the, uh, under the reality that when Jesus, when Jesus was baptized, this is what the Father said to him. He said, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And then later in the Scriptures it says that I am in Him. So if I am in Him, and he is pleased with his son, then he is pleased with me. I don't, I don't do anything to earn God's pleasure because I do things because I have God's pleasure. Do you hear me, church? This is good news. I would be amiss if I did not add in, in conclusion this very stern warning. Serving, and oh my gosh, Serving the church is not always easy. Often the church can be unlovely and unlovable. Oftentimes those who call themselves believers finds their growth in Christ virtually non-existent and like newborn babies who have been deprived of being fed. I want to put that picture in your mind of a newborn baby who is deprived of being fed. We have people who have said they've been believers 20 or 30 years who react much the same way a newborn baby does when they are deprived of being fed. And 
And this can lead your heart to be discouraged. You can become very discouraged. For those of you who are looking to go into the ministry, I can tell you this, one of my first things, I learned this from Charles Spurgeon, you can do anything else in your life, go do it. You don't want this. You better ensure, and I'm not telling you not to do what God's called you to do, but you don't want this. Church, uh, serving the church can be very difficult. So what are we to do? Here's what we're to do when you are to serve difficult people. Are you ready? Hey, I ain't never been to seminary. I learned this on the streets of East Brent Baptist Church and Pine Summit Baptist Church. You hear me? I learned this in the hood. I know what I'm talking about now. Here's what you do. It is in these moments that you reflect on your heart. It is in these moments that you reflect on your heart and you're asking, and you ask yourself, are you looking for others to give you some sort of validation in order to, in order to say that you are now faithful? That's a big threat. That's a big threat. You turn your gaze on your own heart and ask Jesus, what are you showing me about me? And then when I turn my gaze back on the bride of Jesus, I do so with the desire to see her as Christ sees her. A beauty that reflects him. I have often said from this pulpit, from this, well, it's not a pulpit anymore, it's more of a music stand now. But often, I've often said from this place as your pastor and preaching over the past six years. I have, there is no secret with me. You want to know my big secret? I want to see us reflect the beauty of Jesus in Pennsylvania. For the reality is this. The church's beauty comes because of who she is in Christ. And therefore, I am called to love what he loves. And when I go through this simple, these four, five simple things, I reflect on my own heart to see if I'm looking for others to give me a validation. I look at my heart to see uh, Jesus, what is he showing me about me? I turn back to gaze upon the bride of Christ with the desire to see her as Christ sees her with beauty. And when I do that, I find a renewed joy. I find a renewed joy on Monday mornings to serve the church once again. I find a renewed joy every Sunday morning to come and to preach the gospel again. Because if we can just be more beautiful, if we could just reflect Him, this is what it means to use my gospel freedom to serve the church. That Christ purchased with His blood, and what a privilege it is. Hey family, God is gracious. He has redeemed us through His Son so that we would be freed from enslavement to sin and to self-aggrandizement. Therefore, we are now servants. We are servants who serve out of love. We have been shown through the freedom we have been given. So we serve one another. Because we are poured into so that we might pour into others. I have found this to be true in my life. Those people who are overflowing with gratitude of God's grace are usually the same people who are able to serve and love through the freedom they're given. So as servants, we are called to serve one another. What is a way God has gifted you to serve those you're in community with? What has God given you in your history, in your belongings, 
in your intellect, in your capacity? What has God given you so that you are now able to serve others? For some of you, you are some of the you are an encouraging person, and the way you can serve is through encouragement. You are actually able to encourage people. For others, you're able to lead well. For others, you're able to teach and preach. For others, you're able, hey, listen to me. I remember talking to a senior adult woman here at the church because we were going on these mission trips, and she felt like at one time that she wasn't, uh, she wasn't a part of it. She felt like she was disconnected. And I said, do you want to know one of the main ways I need? Don't worry about doing this. And how, where, where are you in your place right now? Where are you where God has you right now? And we began to talk, and I said, do you want to know one of the main things that I need from you as your pastor? And if you want to be this for me, I would love to have... I had one over at East Brent. Her name was Rhoda Goldsby. She's about this tall. A converted Jew. And she was a prayer warrior. I mean warrior. You would tell her to pray for you and you knew that she was praying for you. You know what I'm saying. Not these people who said, yeah, I got you. I'm talking... I'm talking, she would come up to me as a, uh, before, uh, as a student pastor. She'd come up to me and she'd grab my hand and she'd start praying in Jesus' name. Prayer warrior. So I don't know how God has gifted you. But I do know this. If you are born again, He has gifted you. How or what can you use? And some of you are looking at me going, but I don't have much. You listen to this is the beauty. Oh my gosh, get this. You have just what God has wanted you to have in order for you to serve those around you. Did you hear me? I don't care if you got ten talents, five talents, or two talents. He said the same thing. Welcome now into the joy of your salvation. It's only the guy with one talent who buried it who didn't use it, who was unwilling to do what God had called him to do with it. I don't know where you are in your season of life. I'm a 41-year-old married man with three kids. I pastor a church. That's my season. That's where I am right now. God knows tomorrow all of you could just go, hey, we're done with this cat. Get rid of me. And I'm gone. Okay, I guess I'm not the pastor of Pine Summit anymore. I got to do something else. But I'll tell you this God has uniquely equipped me to be who God wants me to be in this moment, at this time, at this place. He appointed me, my times and my boundaries and my habitations, the book of Acts, Paul says. So don't look at me and talk to me from your, from your lack of things. Look at me and talk to me from the blessings that you have been given. And respond on that. Look around your house. How many of you don't have a cupboard full of food? How many of you, when you go to your closet, don't have enough clothes for you to wear probably a new shirt every day of the month? How many of you have a lawnmower? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you got a lawnmower. Why do we have that many lawnmowers? You ever think about that? Come use my lawnmower. You don't need one. Come use mine. I don't use it. Donnie has a lawnmower, don't you, Donnie? And it works, doesn't it? For me, yes, beautiful. I love it. I'm serious. What if we love one? What if we serve one another? What does that look like for you? This week, what does it look like? What could the Holy Spirit right now be telling you? On how you can serve. You're looking. I believe, I believe this. I believe that God reveals to us things in our life and He goes, Hey, you got this. You have this. Why do we have so many uh so many storage units? Now listen to me. I've said this before. And then I got a lot of plaque out of it. I don't need your emails, I don't need your phone calls, I don't need a conversation. There's nothing sinful about owning a storage unit. If you're moving and you got to put all your stuff in a storage unit, I get it. If you're renting and you're going to buy a place and you don't get it, okay, I get it. I get it. You got a storage unit. Everybody started giving me their reasons. This is why I got a storage unit because I'm about to, okay, okay, hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You can have a storage unit. 
I'm talking about this. I'm talking about having a storage unit full of junk you'll never use, things you'll never do, all because you don't want to use it and you don't want to get rid of it because it's yours. Get rid of it. Have a yard sale. Have a yard sale. Save the money. If you don't know what to do with the money, come see me. i got plenty of options. <laughs> We're going to Guatemala. By the way, can I say this? Do you all know uh, that board out there, the GoFundUs wall? Did you all see how low that thing is? It's unbelievable. We don't have one number over $100. For those of you who don't know, each, each, each envelope equals a dollar amount. If you take off a one, that means you agree to bring a dollar. We're almost fully funded from Guatemala due to the GoFundUs wall, due to the fantastic auction that we had, Ray, Ray did for us. I mean, I'm just overwhelmed. Overwhelmed by God's grace. I love our church. What would it look like for us to serve one another? Would you stand to your feet? As I said in the sermon... There have been times in my life where I have loved because I really didn't love. But I used love as sort of a blanket to, over, to cover my own selfishness, my own pride, my own arrogance. And I know when I first discovered that, man, that hit me hard. As a husband, it almost it wrecked me. As a dad... It forever changed the way I discipled my children. And I don't know, maybe you're here and you're saying, hey, you know what, maybe, maybe you have this overwhelming sense that God has given you something that you could be using, but you've been kind of selfish with it, and hey, just repent, believe. Jesus is better, He's gifted you, He's given to you, and I just want, I want us to leave this place, man, being encouraged by, man, God has tremendously blessed us for this point, for this time, and now we can serve one another. Look for ways to serve one another. What if let us be a people who are intentional about looking for opportunities to serve? Can we do that together? So over the next few minutes, we're going to respond by participating in the Lord's Supper. We're going to come to this moment and we're going to be reminded of the fact that, and I want us to be thinking through this as we gather together in our missional communities with our small groups, I want us to be reminded of this. How did Jesus serve? He gave his body and he shed his blood. And if that is our example of servant, for a servant, then I dare say that we all have a long way to go. Amen? May his example draw us to him. May we repent of where we have failed. May we believe that He is the better servant. And may we serve tomorrow and today and tomorrow in ways that God would just be glorified and that His church would be beautiful because we are a reflection of who He is. May that be the truth. We're going to spend the next few minutes in quiet. As we do that, I want you, um, if you're here and you're a visitor with us, and if you've been baptized and you're a believer, if you're a believer and been baptized, I want you to know that you're welcome to participate in the Lord's Supper with us. Uh, but we are asking that if you are not a believer, that you would withhold participating. You can come up and join us in our communities, but withhold participating because it is called the Lord's Supper. So if you don't, if you don't believe in Him as Lord, then it's not, it's not your supper. So let's spend the next few moments in quiet.
So Jesus, we once again gather together to be reminded of all that you've done for us. Father, would you take this bread and help us realize that this is a symbol of your body. We thank you for your body. We thank you for what you did for us. We take this cup, this cup of the new covenant in your blood, and that as we partake of it, we ask for you to bless it to us. That Jesus, for as often as we eat this bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Bless us now as we are reminded of all your goodness to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.